As you're finding your seat this morning, I'd like for you to take your Bibles and open them up to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 11. You know, I've shared with you before that one of the toughest times, at least for a pastor during um, this time of the year, is telling a, a story, an event that happened in the Bible that is so familiar to everyone um, that it sometimes can lose its punch that it rightly has. Um, this is an event that, that really shook not only the foundations of our world, but shook heaven itself. Um, this is an event that split time from B.C. before Christ to A.D., which is a Latin phrase that means in the year of our Lord. So this is an event like no other event that has ever happened before and will ever happen again. It is truly the most wonderful time of the year. It is no wonder that it's our most prominent and our most sacred of all holidays. The thought, the very thought that God Almighty, the creator of the universe, that that same God invaded our world in the form of a tiny, helpless, innocent little baby. It, it almost defies belief, doesn't it? I mean, it's really something that is so amazing and so incredible that we can't really hardly get our mind wrapped around an event like that. I mean, we sing the songs, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. We sing it so freely, but sometimes we don't even really take time to think about what it is we're actually singing. Even the Christmas songs become so familiar that sometimes we just sing through it without ever letting the reality of that song really stir our hearts and stir our soul the way that it should. We need to stop and ponder the words that we read and the songs that we sing this time of the year. I mean, sometimes I believe it's easier to sing about Christmas than to ask what it's really all about. Something happened one morning that has never happened before. Something happened one day that has never happened before or since. Something happened in a forgotten corner of the Roman Empire in a tiny little village where there was no room in the inn. A baby was born to a frightened young teenage couple who swaddled that baby and laid him in a feeding trough because that's all that there was nearby. Nothing could have seemed more obscure. Nothing could seem so much further from what everybody, even the great theologians of the day, so far removed from what everybody was thinking at that time. What they were looking for was all wrong. Just another Jewish baby, another exhausted mom, another concerned dad, all of them probably feeling just a little bit helpless during that time. Can you even imagine born in a barn? I mean, I've been asked a time or two growing up, were you born in a barn? And that meant shut the door, it's cold outside. Or shut the door, you're letting all the air conditioning out. But here we have a baby and a new mama and a young daddy all literally going through the birthing process in a barn, in a stable, with nothing around except smelly barnyard animals and a lot of hay and straw all over the place. You know, here's something that I, we don't think about very often, but Jesus wasn't the only baby born that night. He wasn't the only child born that day. We, we kind of view the Christmas story in a vacuum that, you know, here's a star of Bethlehem and here's a baby in a manger and mom and dad and animals around and angelic host and shepherds and all that, the scene. You've seen the scene before. We kind of think that, that that happened in a vacuum, that Jesus was the only baby born that day. That's simply not the case. Do you know in our world today, that on any given day that approximately we have a birth rate of about 385,000 babies that are born every single day. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I had to look that up. 
That's how many babies worldwide, approximately about 385,000 babies every single day that passes that are born into the world in which we live. Now, that number certainly wouldn't have been that high 2,000 years ago. The population wasn't nearly what it is today, but suffice to say that Jesus was not the only baby born that day. There were multiple babies born that day. But there was something extraordinary and something remarkable about this particular baby born in this particular place to this particular set of parents. That baby and no other baby was God Almighty wrapped in human flesh. It's a remarkable story of a remarkable birth When it comes to Christmas, we unashamedly confess that behind the carols and the candy, behind the decorations and all of the parties and all the food and all of the festivities, behind all the concerts and all the sermons, behind all of it lies the undeniable historical truth that 2,000 years ago, God became man in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ the Savior of the world. That God stepped in to our lives. He dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. That's what John said in his gospel. We beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus stepped from heaven into our world to live among us. When you read the story of Christ's birth, you can't miss the fact that many people were not ready for the Savior. They weren't ready for what was happening, even though they had been told about it for hundreds of years. They should have been ready. All the signs were there. Everything was coming to a fever pitch. God was up to something and something extraordinary was about to happen. Everybody could feel it. Even the secular kings of the day, they were catching word that something was stirring. The people were were stirring among themselves. Something was about to happen and everybody, the entire world was on edge. And yet it still caught them by surprise. They were looking in all the wrong places for all the wrong things when Jesus was born. Even among the people who knew Mary and Joseph, there were those who had their doubts. But the central question then becomes this, is it true? That, that's the question of the ages. Is it true? Did he really come? Is Jesus the one. And that takes us to Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse number one. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, that is John the Baptist, when he heard about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and said to him, now here's the question, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? There is the question of the ages, first uttered out of the mouth of John the Baptist himself, are you the one, or do we need to keep searching for him? That's the story of John the Baptist. He was in prison. You remember the story? He confronted King Herod about his flagrant immorality, pointed the finger right at him, and just rebuked him, rebuked the king of all people. While he was in prison, John the Baptist had a question that goes right to the very heart of Christmas that we're celebrating this week. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John heard about all of this rumbling that was going on, it had made its way all the way back into the prisons, by the way, 
Word was spreading everywhere about this man named Jesus. They heard about the deeds that he was doing. They were starting to hear about the miracles that he was performing. There was a buzz everywhere and anywhere around them about this man named Jesus. Now when John heard about it in prison... He sent a couple of his disciples, a couple of his students to him. And he says, are you the one? Are you the one who has come? Or do we need to keep looking around for him? Are you the one? Now that central question has echoed down through the corridors of history and time. And it resonates with men and women even today in the 21st century. Is Jesus the one? Or was he just some other teacher from an obscure place in the Middle East? Was he just some crazy guy? Was he just some fool that went out teaching and rebuking people and healing people? Was he just some prophet of the day that they hung on a cross and died? Are we wasting our time here today? If Jesus wasn't real, then this is a fool's venture that we're part of today. That's the question. Is it real? Is he who we believe he is? And I want us to look at this today. I also want to recommend to you a book today. I don't do that very often, but this is a book that has been around for quite some time. It's actually out in two different volumes now. It is written by a man by the name of Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell is one of the great apologists of our day. That is, an apologist is someone that defends our faith. That he goes around to college, where he's, he's much older now, but in the, his day, he was going to college campuses all over the United States and places around the world, arguing the case for the gospel. His books are called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He had a very strong conviction that I share that when you take even an atheist and you give them all of the evidence and you give them all of the proof that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that if they are an honest intellectual atheist, they have to come to the conclusion based upon the evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be. That he is a son of God, the savior of the world. It is a book worth having on your shelf. It's more of a reference book of sorts. um, But that two volume set is something you'll find yourself going back to time and again. Especially when we come into holiday times like Christmas and Easter and things like that. Jesus, are you the one? There's so many lines of evidence that we might follow to answer that question, but um, I want to focus on one that the Jews of the first century would have understood. Now, I'm not going to look at all of these. In fact, we're going to look at what I call my top five. These just my top five. It may not be your top five. It's my top five evidences that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he's a savior of the world. Now, as Josh McDowell went through all of the evidences of the Old Testament, and he began to look at all the prophecies related to Jesus, and he looked at all of the things that happened leading up to and including the time of his birth, he said that there were no less than three hundred prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled at the birth of Christ. More than 300. Can you imagine 300 things all happening in perfect harmony, at perfect timing, in the perfect place, with the perfect people, at exactly the right moment? And yet that's what we have in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you start in Genesis and you go to Malachi, which is all of the Old Testament, you find something about the promised Messiah in virtually every book of the Old Testament. There is some reference, some prophecy, some looking forward to a time. Some of them are crystal clear. Others are maybe require a little more referencing and such, but they're all there for anyone to read. 
out of those hundreds of references, I read through that list a number of times, and to be honest, even up until this morning, I could only get it down to seven. And I I really started looking, and some of them, I, I just decided to pull back a little bit to really my top five. Um, just knowing that there are a lot more out there. Number one, Jesus was born of a virgin. We know that that is true. He was born of, let me even make it more narrow, he was born of a woman. We'll start there. That's a great starting point. Born of a woman. Now, there were some people in the day that just thought that the Christ, I mean, he was God himself, that he would just appear like maybe an angel, that he would just show up on the world scene. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you've waited for. I am the Savior of the world. And if he appeared like that so miraculously in the sky, surely people would have dropped to their knees and worshiped him across all the land. But he didn't come that way. He came exactly as the prophets foretold that a virgin shall conceive and give birth. But he was born of a woman, Mary. And there's Joseph also there in the background. He doesn't get a lot of press, but he's still there and he still is a pivotal figure in this. Jesus had an earthly mother, but he had a heavenly father. There were those that had doubts. Is this true? Could it be that he was born of a woman? But listen, this story goes all the way back. You might be surprised. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15. All the way back to the very beginning pages of the Bible, you begin to see references of this. It takes us back to the very dawn of humanity in the moments after Adam and Eve first sinned against God. They're beginning to feel the pangs of guilt and shame as they hid from the Lord Himself in the garden. And the Lord said to the serpent who deceived them, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. We find three sentences of judgment in that verse. First of all, we know that there's going to be ongoing hostility between the serpent and the woman. We see that very clearly. He said, I'm putting enmity between you. I'm putting some some bad blood between the two of you. Eve knows now that the serpent cannot be trusted. And she'll never forget that. And nor should we. Secondly, there will be two lines springing forth in humanity. And those two lines will constantly be at odds with one another. Those who follow the ways of the serpent, that is the ways of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And then there are those that follow after the Lord. And they are constantly battling with one another, the old nature and the new nature, both internally and externally. And we see that happening everywhere, right? I mean, find some, you know, atheist on guard and wish them a Merry Christmas. Man, it's like the venom comes out and it's like, okay, I take it back. Have a really lousy Christmas. I mean, you know, that's the weird world that we live in today where people battle out between happy holiday and merry Christmas. I mean, for goodness sakes, really? Someone wishes you a happy holiday, just say thanks a lot. God bless you. Have a great Christmas. We don't need to argue and battle with the world over silly things like that. Be better than that. Be, be, take the higher road than that. Just say thanks so much, have a Merry Christmas, and go about your way. Have a great day. You know, but the world, the lost world and those that know Christ are still in this forever battle that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter number 3 where we see God Himself put this enmity between the serpent and the woman. The third thing we see here is that there will come someone, the he, who will ultimately destroy the serpent's power. The serpent will strike the heel in the crucifixion, but at the, in that same event, the Messiah will crush the serpent's head. 
Though a heel bruise might be painful, a crushed head is fatal. One of the most beloved Christmas carols contains a verse that alludes back to Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15. Here's the first part of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Come desire of nations come, fix in us the humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed, bruise in us the serpent's head. Now, I told you at the beginning, remember that we sing these songs and it just flows off our lips because it's to a familiar melody. And we sing them and we know it's a Christmas carol, but we forget what we're singing about. Those those Christmas carols are rich in theology. They are rich in doctrine, rich in biblical teaching. Where do you find that promise fulfilled in Scripture? Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 18, Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. It's very clear there that Mary, a woman, has conceived, but Joseph is not the father. A virgin has conceived. He was born of a woman. The second thing that we notice from the evidence in the Bible, number two, Jesus was a descendant from Abraham. He was a descendant of Abraham. This one's easy to see. You just go back to the first verse of the New Testament. And there in Matthew chapter 1, you see the genealogy. I mean, it's like reading a Jewish phone book, right? I mean, you just see name after name after name after name after name. And it starts out the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And you see, he is called Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew 1, verse 1. We know from Genesis chapter number 12 that God had already promised that he would bless the entire world through Abraham's descendants. He was an old man. He didn't have a son. How would God do that? Well, God worked a miracle like only God can do. God worked an amazing miracle in Abraham's body and even in Sarah's body. Sarah was a senior adult lady now. And guess what? She's pregnant. Now, if that doesn't give you cold chills and give you kind of sick in your stomach, that, that'll do it. That'll do it. A senior adult couple now finds she's pregnant just as God had promised. It's estimated, and we believe accurately so, that at this time Abraham is 99 years old. Sarah is a lot more spry and young. She's 89. Any, any takers for that? I mean, let's just let's lower the bar like to 65. Any, any takers in that? Oh, honey, guess what? <laughs> I mean, oh, kind of makes my heart skip a beat even thinking about such a thing. And yet here they are. God told them what was going to happen. Sarah heard it. And remember what she did? She laughed. She laughed. She laughed at what the angel said. She said, how could this happen? I mean, like, get a load of this. I mean, I'm old. It hurts to get out of bed in the morning. And you're telling me I'm going to do what? Yeah. You know, when God makes a promise, His promises are true. When God makes a promise, it is as though it has already happened. That's how sure it is. God told him how it was going to happen. And He said, you, your people, the world will be blessed by your descendants. Then comes the lineage, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Judah, the nation of Israel. 2,000 years later, in that succession, 2,000 years later, Jesus was born as part of the line of Abraham, just as God had said. But not only that, he was also a descendant of David. That's the third thing. He was of the tribe of David in 2 Samuel chapter number 7, verses 12 and following, I think down to about verse 16 or so. 
Nathan comes to David and promises that he will never lack a descendant to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Now that's a big promise. You know, because as, as families go, sometimes you just hit the end of a, a line, right? I mean, we've all known somebody that that happened to. Like, wow, my, my uncle, my Uncle Bobby, he's the last one with that name. Now, he had some daughters. They're going to go on, but he's the last of his line. The line stops there. And we, we've known that, but here is a, a strong promise. He said, you're never going to lack that. Your line is going to continue. There will always be a descendant to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse number 5 clarifies that a little further. The promise by stating that a ruler will come who will be a righteous branch, a descendant of David. He will rule with wisdom and understanding. Well, who could that be? Who in the world would that might be? Well, you go back to Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 1 again. Here is Jesus Christ, the Son of David. Lo and behold, here it is. When Gabriel, remember when Gabriel came to Mary that night? He told her that her son would bear that she would bear would be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. You see how it's all coming together now from Genesis into the prophets, into the end of the Old Testament, into the beginning of the New Testament. It's all converging now right on that manger in Bethlehem. Jesus was the one who was spoken of. Now we're going to tag on to that woman again, Mary, that he was born of a virgin. That's a big deal because that just doesn't happen. When King Ahaz doubted God's promises, the Lord said, I'm going to send you a sign that will surprise you. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That was in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. No matter how Ahaz understood this, there was no way possibly that he could have foreseen 700 years. Now listen to this. 700 years later, out into the future, that God would bring it to pass through the miracle of a virgin birth. We don't have to to wonder about this because when an angel spoke to Joseph in a dream, he said all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. He's remind, the, the angels are reminding everybody. Remember what Isaiah said? Remember what the prophet said? Joseph, Joseph, remember what you've learned over the course of your entire life. Don't forget what's happening here. Prophecy is all converging now and you're part of it. Mary's part of it. The baby is certainly part of it. But everything's coming together right now. A virgin has conceived. And when the angel went on to talk to Joseph, he actually quoted Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Quoted it. Remember what the Scripture says. Here's number five. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You see see what's happening now? The lines are getting more and more and more narrow. You see that? As prophecy nears that time of the birth, all of this becomes narrowing down to a laser focus. It comes to a pinpoint in time where God put a star in the sky that says right here. This is where it's happening. This is where it's all taking place. This is where the event that will change the trajectory of the world, this is where it's all coming together. Everything's coming into focus. Bethlehem was not by accident. 
Not only will the Messiah be born of a virgin, but God now specifies exactly where he will be born. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. That's what Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says. Though Bethlehem was small and insignificant, the Messiah will be born there. And here's the amazing part. Micah also gave this scripture, this prophecy, about 700 years before it would happen. Now listen. All of the Jewish leaders knew. Go back and read Micah chapter 5 verse 2. All of the Jewish leaders knew. All of the Jew- Jewish leaders were keenly aware of this prophecy. We know they knew it because when the wise men showed up in Jerusalem looking for the one born king of the Jews, King Herod asked the scribes about it. And the scribes, remember what they did? They quoted Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. If you want to find the Savior, if you want to find the Christ child, if you want to find the coming Messiah, all you have to do, King, is look to Bethlehem. Look to Bethlehem. That's where you'll find Him. This is reiterated again in Matthew chapter 2 and verses 1 through 6. You can read the story again for yourself. Now let, let me boil all this, all this down together. Because nobody, nobody likes a history lesson. I get that. I've just highlighted my top five. Josh McDowell outlined, as I told you, more than 300 prophecies about the life of Jesus. But there is still one big question. Here's the question. Could all of it have happened by chance? Statistics are funny things, okay? I mean, I could ask the question, is it possible for a a meteorite to fall right through the ceiling right now and land on top of that Christmas tree at the very moment we turn it off? Is Is it possible Well, in the realm of infinite possibilities, we have to say, well, okay, yeah, I guess it's possible, but is it plausible? Do you think that I could say at the end of the service today, at exactly the moment I say amen, right between that light and this light, a meteor is going to fall, come through the roof, on top of this tree, squash it to the ground, Right as we all stand up to go home, that's how it's going to happen. Is it possible? In infinite reality, it is possible. Is it plausible? Plausible? Probably not. For me to get all that right. But people people get paid to ask questions like this. Is it possible that all of this just happened by chance? Well, if we concede that in infinite reality of statistics that anything is possible, we then have to ask, but what is the chance of that happening? I mean, if you say, well, yeah, I guess anything could happen, but what are the chances of that happening? Well, oddly enough, there are much smarter people than me out in this world. One of them is a mathematician by the name of Peter Stoner. Peter Stoner investigated that very question. Is it possible? Of course, you have to say, yes, it's possible. But what are the chances that it all happened the way the Bible said that it would at the moment it happened? What are the odds of that happening? Well, here's what Peter Stoner did. Instead of looking at all 300 prophecies, he narrowed it down to only eight. Just eight. Not all of the prophecies that were fulfilled. 
Just eight of them. He said, I've got to do that to, to make this number a number that we can actually tabulate, okay? So let's just take eight of the prophecies and put it to the test. After doing the calculations, he concluded that the odds, the chances of all eight things happening as it's recorded that it happened, when it happened, with whom it happened, where it happened, that the odds of that were 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Now that is the number 1 followed by 17 zeros. That's a big number. I'm not even sure how to say that number other than it's a really big number. It is a number that really you could not really count to. If you started counting right now, you would die before you finished. Your children would die if they picked up where you left off. Your great, great, great grandchildren would die before they got to that number counting every second of every day. It's a big number. It's a really big number. But let, let, I'm a very practical person. I can't conceive of a number that big. I wouldn't know if, if it fell on my head. So here's what Josh McDowell did. He took that number and brought it down to a, a way that maybe helps us better understand. He said that if you took enough silver dollars to cover the entire state of Texas, every square millimeter of space was covered. Now, some would be overlapping, obviously, but you had to cover the entire state, every millimeter of space, with silver dollars. Then you went up in a helicopter, and you took one silver dollar that was painted red on one side, and you threw it out of the helicopter and it landed somewhere in the middle of the state of Texas that is all covered with silver dollars. Then you blindfolded a volunteer and sent them out into Texas and said, find that silver dollar. Find the one that's red. The odds of him or her finding that red on one side silver dollar somewhere in the entire state of Texas that's the odds of eight things happening as the Bible predicted. Now we say, my gosh, that's just not, that's impossible. I mean, that's impossible. I mean, where do I stop? I'm, I'm, going, I'm blindfolded. I'm looking for the silver dollar. Oh, make, should I stop here? No, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to go over here. Well, not there. Maybe I'll walk to El Paso. We get to El Paso, well, may, well, you know, maybe the Lord just likes Laredo. Let me, let me go to Laredo. Well, now, wait a minute. Houston's, I'll go to Houston. That's a big city. Maybe it's in Houston. I would venture to guess that you could let someone choose about 15,000 chooses. They never get it. They can go to any city they wanted because this spot or this spot or this spot all is covered with coins. We get to the point where we think, you know what, that's just kind of silly, isn't it? Maybe it happened the way the Bible says it did. We believe it did. We believe that Jesus came exactly the way the Bible says that he did. It's the only plausible thing to believe. Anything else just gets really weird. You know, if Jesus isn't your Savior today, then Christmas really isn't Christmas for you. It really isn't. It's just a fun holiday, a time of food and family and festivities. Christmas rightly belongs to those who worship Jesus as Lord and Savior. It belongs to those whose lives have been changed by the, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's who Christmas belongs to. But might I suggest to you that if you have not trusted Him as Lord and Savior, that Christmas can be yours today. 
Christmas can be yours today. Listen, God did not send Jesus into this world to wow the world. He sent Jesus to be the Savior of the world, to save people from their sin. That's why Jesus came. And there's no greater way to honor the Lord Jesus. There's no greater way to, to thrill the heart of God than to give your life to Jesus Christ today. That's what it's all about. That's what Christmas is all about. I can't imagine a better time to do that than as we gear up to the time we celebrate His birth. If you are here today, listen, if you have not trusted Jesus, if you've not asked Him, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Save me today. I want to begin living my life for you today, right here, right now. Am I talking about perfection? No. Am I saying, oh, you got to, you know, you got to give up everything in the world? And no, I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying start where it starts. Give your life to Christ. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. We've all sinned. Ask Him to forgive you and ask Him to live in you today. You do that and you'll have a Christmas like nothing you've ever experienced before. It all starts right now, right?